So good afternoon. Uh, so last time I think we stopped somewhere here. We began discussion of uh, the organization of the nervous system. We said there are basically two main parts: the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, right? And uh, we said an easy way to think about that is to simply think of it as an input-output system. That is, it takes sensory input as input and produces motor output as output. Sensory input could be you know what you know as your special senses. Right, uh, touch, vision, hearing, and all that, and motor output could be in the form of you know movement of hands, movement of legs, right, movement of the entire body, right, or movement of uh, eyes and uh, speech, the articulatory apparatus. So, so it's easy to think of it as input-output system, and you can think of it as some kind of a deep network, which we already covered, right. Uh, so, input is given to the first layer, the input layer, and it, that goes through a bunch of layers. An output goes out and controls the motor apparatus, motor is or the motor organs. Now here again, you can divide further these uh, sensory areas and motor areas. So the so-called input layer can be divided further into smaller layers. So let us say sound comes to one of these layers, vision comes to some other layer. And this is like retina basically. Touch comes to some other layer, which is like your entire skin, the body surface. And uh, all these three different sources of uh, sensory information, they go into one of these hidden layers, and then that information propagates over a series of layers. And finally, it, uh, it goes to a part of the brain which controls your motor output, like you know, controlling your eyes or hands and legs and speech and things like that. So we can think of a general schematic like this. And uh, we also talked about uh, three different levels of control. So this input and output, right? We talked about it as if it's a single pipeline, but actually there are multiple levels here. So let's say the lowest level is at the spine level of spinal cord itself. Like you know, these are called reflexes, where input goes to the spinal cord and output comes back immediately from the spinal cord itself at the same level of the spinal cord. So that is the spinal cord level. The next level input comes from the world and then goes into the spinal cord and goes up to the brain, but goes to the Subcortical level, not all the way to the cortex, but stops at subcortical level and comes back, producing movement. So that is the subcortical level. Then higher in the in the highest level of control, information from the world goes into the spinal cord, goes all the way to the cortex, comes back down, and then produces movement. So that's the highest level. Okay, now, so the one of, there is a sheet of the of neurons covering the entire brain surface. So this is called the cortex. It has uh, six layers of neurons in that. Um, so and everything deep inside the brain, other than the cortex, right? There are lots of different masses of neurons. These are called subcortical structures, and very often these structures, right, uh, form you know, small assemblies, you know, form uh, different circuits, and these circuits go by different names. We'll come to all that later. Okay, so you have the brain surface, which is the cortex, and then internal parts of the brain which are called the subcortical structures. Now this brain surface, the cortex, you know, is grossly organized in terms of large lobes, right? Uh, so these are the frontal lobe. I think we already seen it once in one of the earliest classes. So the pink part here is the frontal lobe. These are like, you know, continents, right? And uh, the yellow is the temporal lobe. The green is the occipital lobe and the blue is the parietal lobe. Okay, and then way back you have the cerebellum, that uh, brown organ with you know kind of stripes on it. Now the lobes have different regions uh, which have different functions, so we'll come to those functions later. This is just to give an idea that you no know, different functions are, are uh, distributed over these different lobes. Uh, so, for example, in the so one big landmark right, or big big thumb rule there that you can use is uh, you can think of this this uh, big landmark, the central circle, sulcus. So we need to get introduced to the terms sulci and gyri. Okay, and uh, sulci is plural and sulcus is a singular. And so the other term is gyri or gyrus. Uh, so sulci are these chasms or valleys, sorry. Let me just say valleys. And gyri are like mountains. Um, 
and he is a mnemonic to remember which is which is in hindi or sanskrit giri right is a mountain okay like so so jai jai sounds like giri okay so these uh, so you can see lots of we'll look at some of these names later on but one key landmark that you can remember will be quite useful is a central sulcus it's a valley and it is central so therefore it's called central sulcus and so you can divide the brain into the front part and the back part okay loosely speak for the anterior brain and the posterior brain so this is posterior anterior posterior anterior and posterior anterior is front posterior is back so the posterior brain is all about input or you know this is a very broad thumb rule okay and anterior brain is all about output input output yeah so uh, so input can be straight away input layer or they or layer so again refer back to this general schematic <coughs> so the there are this input layer proper which is sensory inputs and then you have can have many number of hidden layers right so mm-hmm. if i can divide this whole network into two halves there are layers which are close to the input side layers which are closer to the output side okay so this anterior and posterior brain is somewhat like this the sensory areas and then slightly higher versions of the sensory areas going to the midmost level and beyond that uh, the at the other end you have motor areas and then you have this hidden layer which layers which are close to the motor output okay so these also can be considered like motor so i can think of this entire section as sensory which is a terrible uh, simplification but it's okay for now and i'll consider the entire thing as motor right and somewhere in this so this middle one is kind of neutral because basically in this mapping we are transforming the sensory input into motor output so somewhere in the middle you make a transition so i'll call this whole thing roughly into sensory or sensory related areas and this is motor or motor related areas i'll make it more precise right as we go along so when i talk about posterior brain the posterior brain is like the sensory areas and anterior brain is all about motor so let me now go deeper into this and explain what is the sensory area okay let me go back here so if you look at the posterior brain this part of the posterior brain in the inside the occipital lobe uh, process visual information so in fact uh, when visual information comes to the brain especially the cortex the first place it comes to is this this area called the primary visual cortex okay then if you look at uh, sound information or auditory information the first place it comes to in the cortex is uh, this part which is called the primary auditory cortex then similarly if you look at touch information the first place it comes to is uh, actually this part this deep blue okay so this deep blue is the primary somatosensory area and lighter versions of it is higher level touch areas so basically you see that uh, already and you see uh, here so the thing is this this chasm which you don't see in normal pictures right so you see they have opened this these two folds to reveal a inner uh, part of the cortex okay so that is where you have areas which process gustatory information that is taste and similarly there you have here areas which process all factory information or smell right so you see that uh, in the posterior brain so i'm including this also into the posterior brain everything front okay so this is kind of you take it as still in the back so everything in the back is still sensory related and in the if you go to the front you see that uh, this part is called the motor cortex okay so that is uh, <clears throat> that's the part which controls the movement and then if you go to even more front areas so this is called prefrontal in within the frontal lobe uh, this is called the pre frontal cortex okay which has areas related to planning and all that. okay so let me sort this out and put it in proper order so thing is whenever you talk about sensory information 
it, it is sourced by some sensory organ or a sensory transducer if you want to use engineering technology. So there's a part of the body which converts some kind of a sensory information into electrical signals. These signals are conveyed by nerves, nerve fibers to the brain. And only thing is, in this process, these signals climb up uh, and, you know, in, in, in systematically in, in certain passing through certain stages and finally arrive at the cortex. Okay, so that, uh, so these are called ascending pathways. So, so this climbing up starts, for example, if you look at touch information, let's say I touch this finger, this information goes via this nerve to the spinal cord and then goes up. So the blue is information going up. Okay, so it goes up to a bunch of stages and finally it goes to a part of the brain like called thalamus. So we'll see what the thalamus is later. This is a particle structure and from beyond thalamus it goes to this part of the brain which is called somatosensory area which is a primary somatosensory area that is that's where the touch information first goes. So you'll see this pattern in pretty much all sensory information. It is sourced by some kind of a sensory organ or a sensory transducer. In this case, the skin converts your mechanical input into an electrical input. From there on, it makes an upward journey uh, by coursing along a, some five nerve fibers. And there are some bunch of stages. You don't have to worry about all the names and all that. It, it goes through a bunch of layers. And finally, it ends up in uh, the, it, so everything is in the sur you know, surfaces in the cortex. Okay, it, it's like imagine brain as some kind of a multi-story building, right? Multi-story building. There are multiple levels, so there are you know doorways, and uh, there are many entrances. So there are many doors, many entrances. So people can enter it from, from many doors. So then they climb up, right? These stories, and finally everybody arrives in the uh, the terrace. Okay, so everybody comes and meets in the terrace. So the terrace is like the cortex. Okay, so, so this is how touch information uh, proceeds, right? So this area, right, somatosensory sensory cortex, right? So this is the area, this blue region, is what is shown here. So this, is, this is like a section, this is called a coronal section. So in this little portion is what you are seeing here. So similarly, if you look at visual information, so obviously you know that vision starts from the eyes. So if you are looking at something, that information falls, goes into the eye and falls on the retina. So image is formed on the retina. So this retina information goes again through a bunch of nerves uh, and which goes through a bunch of stages. So here again, uh, say, uh, visual information from retina straight away goes to uh, a part of the thalamus. So thalamus is like a big junction box. Right, most sensory information has to go through thalamus. So I'll talk more about thalamus later. And from thalamus straight away it goes to the primary sensory cortex, the primary sorry, primary visual cortex, right, which is the first stopover of visual information in the cortex. Okay, and after that it goes to a bunch of layers. We'll discuss all that in detail uh, when we discuss visual information or visual path, visual system. Again, same pattern you see in the uh, auditory cortex. Right, so information from the into the that goes into the ear, right? This is your tympanum or the eardrum, right? And there, it, uh, the air coming in, you know, the air waves vibrate the tympanum. Tympanum then moves these little bones called malleus, incus, and scapes, right? and then these bones uh, kind of start tugging at a certain membrane called the basilar membrane, right? And then the membrane vibrates because of all this kind of tugging activity. This membrane is located inside a structure called cochlea, right? And uh, from there on it, also inside that cochlea, you convert, that's when you first convert the mechanical stimulus called sound into electrical signals. So until this point, the mechanical waves of the air are converted into first into the mechanical vibrations of the tympanum, then mechanical vibration of tympanum converted into the mechanical motions of the small bones. Mechanical motion of the bones are converted into mechanical vibrations of another membrane which kind of looks like a long, like a tongue, okay, like a long membrane. Uh, then only then finally inside, so there's a lot of mechanical to mechanical conversion within the auditory system, like at the, at the level of inner ear. And only inside the cochlea, this mechanical information is converted into electrical signals. From there on, nerves take over. 
So your auditory, auditory information goes courses along these nerves, goes up to the first stopover, that is called uh, the cochlear nucleus, and the second stopover is superior olivary nucleus. The third stopover is inferior colliculus, and you, you need not mug up all this. I just want to have an idea that this is a pattern. It goes through a bunch of stages, right? And uh, then it, this is your thalamus. Thalamus is a much bigger structure. Within the thalamus, there are many different uh, smaller regions. Uh, in there's a region called medial geniculate nucleus, right? And then it goes to the uh, auditory cortex. So you see the pattern that you see in all of them is. So this is a sensory input. Right, this is the transducer. From there, it goes to you know layer one, uh, goes to layer two, etc. Layer three, bunch of layers. Okay, doesn't matter. Finally, after that, it goes through, ends up in primary sensory cortex, CTX is cortex. This is a pattern, whether it is touch or vision or auditory. In case of vision, so okay, let me put uh, here thalamus. So that is a standard picture in all of them. In case of vision from sensory input, which is retina, it straight away goes to thalamus and straight away then goes to primary visual cortex. In case of auditory, it goes through some two, three layers before it goes to thalamus. In case of uh, touch, again, it goes through a bunch of layers and they are all in this, some of them are in the spinal cord. So what I want to you know, emphasize here is, don't worry about these anatomical details, just look at the connectivity pattern. Because if you look at connectivity pattern, it looks very simple. It seems logical. If you look at the anatomical, you know, all the twists and turns and bends and all, all the names of the nerves, it looks you know, mind boggling, it looks quite complicated. But this is what a medical student will worry about. Because obviously when they cut the brain open, they'll have to know which, which wire is where and what is, what is the wire they're looking at, okay. But for us, we want to understand the logic of it because this course is about neural principles and not about, you know, the anatomy. Okay, so once the information goes to the cortex, the artery cortex, uh, that is available here. So this is the, so this whole thing is a temporal lobe, right? So the this upper part of temporal lobe is called the superior temporal area. Okay, so that is where you have, you know, the outer information ends up there. Then you have olfactory system from nose, right? It is, the information about smell is conveyed by olfactory nerve. And it goes to a region called alpha olfactory bulb. That goes to a bunch of uh, you know, cortical areas and also goes to a subcortical structure called amygdala. Okay, so the so thing is, the three major senses, that is sound, vision, and touch, have one kind of organization. The other two senses, the taste and the olfaction are somewhat older, evolutionarily older senses. Uh, so their uh, organization is slightly different. So, I keep, so I'll keep talking about these three, so that they have a similar organization. Okay, so now we talked about the how the sensory information starts from the sensory transducers, climbs uh, over a bunch of regions. So I didn't show all the re I'm not showing all the regions in this picture, but there are regions. And and sorry, uh, sorry, they are all here. And uh, so so you end up with the primary sensory area, sensory cortex. Now after that, it projects to another layer. Right, so let us see what the second layer is. So the second layer is called parietal lobe, right? So there are these important parietal areas inside the parietal lobe. Now, there's another picture I made to show you. Oh, okay, so see that outer information comes here, right? From there, these higher layers that we are talking about proceed in this direction. Okay, visual information comes here. From there, the higher visual areas proceed in this direction. Touch, touch information comes here. From there, the higher touch areas proceed in this direction. They all meet in this huge area, which is called posterior parietal. Right, so because all this segregation of information into an auditory and visual and touch and all that, 
it makes sense only at early processing stages beyond some point you want to combine all this and come up with uh, more abstract concepts like for example let us say you are eating an apple right you are holding the apple in your hand you are looking at it that right? you are you are just biting into it uh, so look at the kind of sensory information you are getting from it right now you are looking at it you see it's colorful it's red it is round so all this information is processed by your visual areas right and uh, when you bite into it, it makes a crunchy sound uh, and you can even hear it with your ears so that is processed by your auditory areas it kind of it's hard to feel right it's not like tomato tomato is soft um, apple is hard that hardness is processed by your touch areas and obviously you are not uh, when you experience an apple you combine all this into integrated experience you are not treating it as separate you know sensory properties so to integrate that obviously in the network you have to combine all that and even anatomically the wires which carry this information should come to some common place so so they can combine all this information and come up with some kind of a common concepts so that kind of a combination occurs because the problem with the brain anatomy is you don't see all these wires running around okay so actually wires run under the hood under the surface right so if this is a cortical surface now all these major wires linking one area to another they they run deep inside like this so you cannot see them from outside so you don't know which area is talking to which area when you look at the brain from outside so it, it looks all totally confusing whereas if you if you follow the connectivity pattern using certain technology right you see the logic of it so obviously the primary sensory information comes here after that the projection patterns proceed like this coming to this big junction area that is where the posterior brain combines all the different sources of sensory information and creates this kind of integrated experience of the world and also extracts concepts then you know converts those concepts into language and words all that happens somewhere here this is a big busy area and people give divide into small areas and give names and all that don't worry too much about this fine grain uh, you know segregation or segmentation just think of all this as you know a big a busy area where all this information is coming together okay so so when we talk about uh, this next area after sensory that is where we are that is this you know parietal lobe and uh, within this parietal lobe so you can have two areas posterior parietal and superior parietal this this whole thing is a parietal lobe right so here the posterior this lower part is called inferior parietal lobe upper part is superior parietal lobe and part which is slightly behind is called posterior parietal lobe so point is uh, don't take these words too seriously if you roughly know what they mean that's enough right but point is uh, point is it's a continuum so it's very hard to you know, draw sharp boundaries and say this is where the posterior parietal lobe begins and this is where superior parietal lobe ends and it's very hard to say that right because it's, the whole thing is a continuum so it's enough if you understand the spirit of it right so so here is where these different sensory informations come together then you form associations right among different sensory areas therefore this big area is called sensory association area is where you combine different streams of sensory information and come up with this kind of integrated concepts high level abstract concepts such so spatial knowledge and spatial representation of the world so basically you a uh, couple of questions you answer them right using this representation you are identifying objects in the world that is what are they and next you are also trying to determine where are they in the world because you are trying to construct a model of the world right here in the parietal area right and two important questions you would like to answer out of this representation of the world is you are representing different objects and so you are trying to answer what is that object and where is the object so this where is the object part is what is uh, mainly constructed inside this you know posterior parietal cortex so that's why it is responsible for uh, generating or representing spatial knowledge then superior parietal lobe you see the superior parietal lobe is halfway between this is all touch information this little strip and this is visual so you see that it is between your touch and vision so therefore it integrates touch and vision okay so there you will have neurons which respond to both visual information and touch information 
So this patch of cortex is between touch and vision. Now, about the same area, slightly in the inferior posterior, you know, uh, parietal area, and particularly in the left brain, in most people, you have uh, areas which process language, right, or more specifically, language comprehension, language understanding. So this is located in the left hemisphere, in about 95 percent of the right hand individuals, and in the end in the uh, 60 percent of the left hand individuals. So that means the remaining 40 percent, this area is on the right side. So one thing that here I need to mention here is, if you look at uh, more basic sensory processing, it occurs both in the left brain and the right brain. If you look at primary visual cortex, right? This is the left, of, uh, left occipital lobe, right? There's visual processing here. So the, the exactly analogous area on, in the right hemisphere also will be processing vision. Okay, so basic sensory information is processed in both hemispheres in a symmetric fashion. But when you go to slightly higher levels and look at more higher level functions like language processing, that is typically lateralized. It occurs only in one hemisphere and not so much in the other hemisphere. So therefore, language is typically uh, you know all handled by one half, right, of the uh, one half of the brain, which is typically left half. And uh, so therefore, the Wernicke's area, which is why it is called, it controls language comprehension. And Broca's area, the, the another area which is in the front in the anterior brain, controls language production. So, like I said, everything this is the central sulcus, right? Everything to the front is output, everything to the back is input. Okay, language is input, right? And understanding of language is input is input function that is done here. Production of language, that is speech, right, is output function. So that is that happens before the central sulcus. Now, so left posterior parietal is into language comprehension, right? Then what about the right posterior parietal? What does that do? Okay, right posterior parietal area uh, does, uh, you know, spatial analysis, especially at large scale. Okay, so what does that mean? So when, when we talk about, you know, what different brain areas do, that is, we say that uh, right posterior parietal cortex is into, is responsible for spatial analysis. Now, what does it mean? How do people say that? What that means is, when that area is damaged, what kind of uh, impairment do you see in that person's behavior? So based on that, you say that, okay, that part is respons responsible for that function, whatever function is impaired. So for example, if there is a damage to right posterior parietal in an individual, and uh, these people will have a problem with uh, processing the information from the left half of the world. So obviously we know that the right and left are relative concepts. It depends upon which way you are looking. So based on the, your head direction, right, or even your body orientation, you can say that certain parts of the world, world are on my left and certain parts are on my right. And what is interesting is when the right postoperatal is damaged, people start neglecting the left half of the world because there is a very interesting pattern of mapping of the world onto the brain. That is, the left half of the world is mapped onto the right half of the brain and vice versa. Right half of the, the world is mapped on the left half of the brain. The so same thing with vision, for example, the objects that you see on your right side, that information goes to your left brain, left, left primary visual cortex. Similarly, objects that you see on the left side of the world, right, uh, go to your right brain. Similarly, sounds that you hear on, on coming from the right, primarily go to the left brain and vice versa. Even touch, so when somebody touches your right hand, that information is processed by your left brain, by the primary somatosensory cortex in the left brain. So there's a kind of interesting, you know, mapping from right to left. Similarly, even in the motor side, if you want to move your right hand, the command for that comes from your left motor cortex. Okay, so there is an interesting kind of a mapping between, you know, right side and left side. So therefore, when you have damage of the right postoperatal cortex, right, the persons the person will tend to neglect the left half of the, of the world, and they'll neglect the whole, whole all aspects of the world. It's not just vision, not just touch. They have tendency to like neglect you know this cuts across multiple sensory modalities. It is not only vision. It's as though that part of the world doesn't exist for them at all. 
So therefore, if you ask them to, let's say, copy the picture of a clock, which is what you're seeing in this uh, slide, right? They have drawn the whole clock, but they kind of, they forgot noting down the numbers on the left side, the hour numbers on the left side. So they, they're not fully aware of the left half of the world. So similarly, in this task, they are asked to just look at this image, right? And then uh, just, you know, pay attention to it and just scan this image. So there are lots of these small features, like in you know, a shape like L, shape like T junctions and so on. So normal person will just scan over the entire image and you know look at various features and jump from one feature to another. Whereas a person with this kind of a problem, this problem is called uh, left hemineclect. So damage to the right posterior parietal cortex causes a condition called left hemineclect. In that condition, the patients uh, will neglect the left half of the world, and which is what you are seeing. So even though the image is much bigger, they they are only confining themselves their scan pattern only to the right half of the image. So one, one more way. So this can be even more uh, quite dramatic. In this uh, classic study, the, 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 this, is, uh, this was done in the city of Milan, right? And uh, the patients were asked to, they were taken to a street, right? And uh, they were, so, so there is a cathedral at one end of the street. So they can go to the opposite end of the street and look at the cathedral or they can come to the cathedral end of the street, turn their back to the cathedral and look at what is in front of the cathedral. Okay, so, and in each condition, they were asked to describe what is there in front of them. So what happened was when they were looking at the cathedral and describe, making their description, uh, they ignored all the houses and buildings that are located on the left side. And when they came to the cathedral and put their back on the cathedral and looking at the street from the cathedral point of view, and they were giving commentary, this time again, they ignored all the buildings on the left side of, the, of, of them. And point is, depending upon where they are situated, they're ignoring certain part of the world completely, right? So it is, so the ignorance is not just visual. I mean, it's a very profound thing. You know, you, you don't even acknowledge that part of the world. So, so this is called hemineclect and occurs because of damage to right post Now, if you go to temporal lobe, temporal lobe has, uh, so this is a temporal lobe and temporal lobe is, can be roughly divided into three regions. So it's a long uh, kind of a rectangular sheet of cortex, right? You can divide it into like, you know, three parallel lines. So the upper, upper, middle and lower. Upper part is called the superior temporal gyrus because actually there are three gyri. Okay, and uh, superior gyrus, middle gyrus, and inferior gyrus, right? The meaning is quite obvious. In the superior gyrus is where you have uh, the region which uh, you know, processes auditory information or sound information. And the middle one is where you have you know, information about memory and language and all that. And in the bottom one, uh, you have information. So this is, so the visual information comes here. After primary analysis of the image, it is sent to this inferior temporal gyrus to find out what is that object that I'm looking at. Okay, so in, in this inferior temporal uh, gyrus, or inferior temporal area, there are neurons which respond to complex objects. Because if you look at the primary visual cortex, that here neurons that cannot respond to, you know, apples and oranges and, you know, bicycles and you know, objects. They can only respond to little patches of color or, you know, little straight lines with some orientation and things like that. They cannot uh, understand full objects, complex objects. But if you go to uh, the inferior temporal lobe, you'll find neurons which can understand whole objects and complex objects. And typically here, since for a human being, the most, uh, so, so obviously they represent objects which are of interest or relevance to that individual. And for us, uh, some of the most complex patterns which are very important for us are other people, okay, or other, other faces, faces of other people. So there is a whole region inside the inferior temporal area where neurons respond to face images. That, that's called the fusiform gyrus, which is also located somewhere here. Okay, so now let us come to the motor side. So, so the so motor side, you know, can control your eyes and hands and legs and all that. And the broad thumb rule I've given is 
the front part of the brain, the anterior brain is all about output. So motor is all here. And here again, there are lots of subregions. Let us look at them. So again, let us uh, go with the this grand uh, you know, landmark, right? So this is like this is your central sulcus. And just before the central sulcus, in which is, in what is called the precentral gyrus, because there's a gyrus here, you have the primary motor cortex. So if I simulate neurons here, uh, because when it comes to sensory information, the way you probe the neurons is, you present some sensory stimulus, let's say show a picture, and see if some neurons are responding to that. You play a sound, see if some neurons are responding to that. Or you touch the skin somewhere, and see some neurons respond to that. That is how you probe sensory response of the brain to, to input. But if you want to understand output, you don't present anything, you activate the brain and see which output is generated. Okay, so, if, so for example, if you activate neurons in the primary motor cortex, it will produce some movements and these movements are typically very small local movements. The primary motor cortex is still a very low level motor cortex, right? The, just like primary sensory cortex <coughs> is a low level sensory cortex in the hierarchy. Primary motor cortex is also low level motor cortex in the hierarchy. If you activate neurons here, it might produce and produce a twitch inside a muscle somewhere, right? Or maybe it will produce a small movement in your finger, right? It won't be able to produce a huge, uh, for example, if you want to wave your hand, you cannot produce a kind of movement by activating some part of the motor, primary motor cortex. Now there are higher motor areas, like the supplementary motor area, for example, so here, if you activate uh, the brain, the activation means just put an electrode and then pass current. Because brain activation means it's all electricity, right? We have studied that in the you know, last, in last class or last class before that. So pass current here, and then if you activate some part of the supplementary motor area, it will produce a huge movement. Maybe you will just you know kick your leg, you know, or you know maybe fling your hand in some random direction. That's the kind of movement you will see if you activate the supplementary motor area. Premotor cortex is also very similar, uh, but only thing is one difference between premotor and supplementary area is neurons in premotor cortex even respond to visual information. That is, when you produce motor movement, some movement, there are two kinds. You are responding to some stimulus and producing movement. That is a one kind of movement. Or you are not responding to any stimulus. You are producing this movement all by yourself. Right, so let us say you are you know, sitting quietly in the couch and you got bored and suddenly you want to go somewhere. That stimulus has come from within you, so you're getting up all by yourself. That kind of a command typically comes from the supplementary motor area. But uh, somebody throws a ball at you and you move your hand to meet the ball, that kind of a response, activity, then that kind of a condition, you'll see activity in the Pre-motor part. So that is the main difference between supplementary motor and pre-motor. Well, let us look at some of these things. So if you activate the primary motor cortex, it will produce only local activation of muscles. It won't produce a huge movement of a whole leg or something like that. But if you activate pre-motor cortex, it will produce a sequence of movements, more complex movements. Especially this area is active in case of visually guided movements, like for example, catching a ball. Uh, the supplementary motor cortex is uh, is active. Again, if you activate that, it will produce a sequence of movements. But these movements are typically intrinsically generated. This is the main difference. This is intrinsically externally generated. And one more thing is, uh, even if you are just imagining movement, you're not actually producing movement, you're just imagining movement, right? Mentally imagines movement. Even then you produce activity of SMA. And SMA is also a very active when you're producing extremely complex movements. Like, you know, let's say you're a musician, you are playing a piano or a violin or a veena or something, right? It involves lots of complex hand and finger movements. In such situations, uh, the supplementary motor cortex is active, especially in early stages. But once it becomes more well practiced movement, the activity switches to lower levels, to primary area and motor area and pre motor area and all. So that is so. All these movements, all these areas, 
primary motor, premotor, supplementary motor. They they activate your limbs and things like that. So okay, when I talk about movements, so one simple definition of movement is anything that activates muscle, right, is movement. That that's what that's as was Ben is concerned. Producing movement means activating muscle. The question is which muscle am I activating? Okay, so there is uh, so all all that you are you know that you are able to control like you know like your hands and trunk and legs everything all these movements are controlled by what is called skeletal muscle okay so when you are moving that you are the nerves are basically sending electrical signals to this muscle the skeletal muscle and therefore it produces produces a movement so there are the other kinds of muscle which are more delicate which are more internal which is for example muscles that control uh, eye movements so actually there are uh, three pairs of muscles which control each eye. Maybe we'll talk about that later on. We control discuss eye, you know, eye movements. So um, that's also another kind of a movement, and that is controlled by a part of the brain which is somewhere here. Right? Uh, it's not shown in this picture, but we'll call this frontal eye fields. Right? Eye fields are kind of area of the brain which controls eye movements. This is located inside the frontal lobe, so therefore they are called frontal eye fields. Then there is another area which is the Broca's area, which is again located somewhere here. And we have seen it before, which controls speech production. Okay, so, so these are all different kinds of outputs that you know brain can generate. And you see that all of them are located uh, in the in the frontal lobe, but you might have noticed that we haven't said anything about this part. Okay, so we said that the frontal brain or the anterior brain is all about producing movement. And so far we only talked about uh, this colored region in the frontal lobe. There's also this white part, uh, which is the foremost region. We haven't said anything about that. Uh, that is called prefrontal cortex and let us talk about that now. Okay, so this slide shows uh, the frontal eye fields. And uh, you see that you see the muscles which control the eyes. You see that there are three pairs of muscles which can control the eyes in three different dimensions. So it's a ball, right? And uh, ball rotates in three different degrees of it has three, degrees, three rotation degrees of freedom. So for each uh, degree of freedom, you need two muscles. In, that's because, see, muscle is like a rubber band. So a muscle can only pull, it can never push. So if you want to turn, so if in a given dimension, if you want to move the eye in one direction, you have to activate one muscle, it will pull it. If you want to move the eye in the other direction, the same axis, you have to activate the other muscle. Okay, so you need for every direction or every dimension, you need two muscles, one for pulling, one for pushing. Okay, so therefore you have three pairs of muscles which control eye movement. So these are all ultimately controlled from, ah, okay, so this is the frontal eye field, so here. That goes through a bunch of regions before it finally activates your eye muscles. So, okay, so, so far we discussed uh, something about the sensory input, right? And then how does sensory input come? What are the pathways and all that? We discussed something about the motor areas and how different kinds of motor outputs are produced. But what about the layers in between? Because most of the brain is in between these two things. Because we, we generally begin discussion with uh, sensory input or motor output because these are in, easier to understand, easier to relate to, right? But the, most of the fun happens in between these two. So all the brain is in between these two. So what happens there? So now let us look at, so earlier I was saying that this whole thing is all just, you know, sensory and this whole thing from middle to the output is all motor. Okay, it's so just a very simplistic way of saying it. So what about this middle part? What happens here? <clears throat> so now <clears throat> let us now think about this a little bit. So if you are looking at a deep network, right, because you might have some experience with that, uh, take a CNN, for example. You give an image and the CNN says, what is that image? Is it a cat or a dog or an apple, what? You change the image and you give, you know, then it will say something else. So point is the CNN simply works as an input output machine. It has no choice. You give it an input, it will produce an output. Right? there is no choice. No, it cannot say, no, no, no. I'm right now bored, I won't give any response. That, that doesn't make any sense. 
Whereas obviously brain cannot work like that, right? When we look at the input, we automatically doesn't respond to, we don't have to respond to everything that we see in front of us. So for example, can you imagine this? You see a tooth, toothbrush in front of you, immediately start, pick it up and start brushing your teeth. Or you take a hammer, you see a hammer in front of you, immediately pick it up and start looking for a nail and start banging it into the wall. So that will be quite absurd, right? I mean, you will be living quite a miserable life if you are constantly responding to environmental stimuli and doing what the stimuli suggests you to do, okay? So always, whenever you are looking at some input, or expose some input, there is always something in the brain which says, shall I respond to it in the first place? And if I have to respond, how should I respond? Like, you know, if somebody says something mean to you, right, something provocative, you can always give it back and, you know, say something equally nasty, or you can kind of withhold, you know, your response and, uh, you know, just put up a more dignified, uh, you know, front, right? So that you have that choice. And that's what is so special about the brain, right? It has a decision to uh, emit a response or withhold a response. Without that, we'll all be kind of slaves of the world. In fact, that's a terrible way to live, right? Because the you know, for addicted people, that's how they live. They cannot uh, live without certain stimuli. There's no control over themselves. So this ability to control your output and withhold it or you know permit it and or release it, that's a very important part of the brain. So brain is not like input output system. Between the input and output, there, you, there is a very important part, which is a decision making system, which is like a gateway, right? The input will be permitted and to produce an output only when the gateway is open. You can close that gate and then there won't be any response at all. Okay, so, <clears throat> so not every sensory input elicits a corresponding motor response. So that gateway is what is happening inside the prefrontal cortex, this whole region. So thing is, you might find it a bit weird because if you look at the simplistic, right, uh, block diagram or this network diagram that we have drawn, input, sensory input comes to one extreme. Then it, all the information goes through a bunch of layers. At the end of it, it then activates some motor areas. Motor areas then actually produce movement in different parts of the body. So the whole thing is all lined up in certain linear direction in the, in the network diagram. It's very easy to understand. But see what's happening in the brain. <coughs> Your, Primary sensory information comes to different parts of the uh, posterior brain, right? Uh, so in visual information comes here, artery comes here, <laughs> touch comes here, all very you know scattered, very you know, far from each other. Whereas if you draw a network diagram, you will draw something like this. Sound, vision, touch, they all should all be next to each other because they're all inputs. And that's the entry point. So they would, you would like to logically place them together and at one end of the network. But whereas in the brain, they're all quite remote from each other. <clears throat> so the sound is here, vision is here and touch is here. Now in your network diagram, all the sensory outputs go to the next layer and next layer, projecting in a systematic fashion, in a sequential fashion, so going from layer to layer to layer. Whereas what's happening in the brain? Here also logically it's projecting like that. But anatomically, they are all placed in a very jumbled order. It's not ordered like this so that you can easily understand. So the next layers are not like that in a linear order. Next layers are here in the center of the posterior parietal. So like I was saying earlier, the artery projects here and then the vision projects here and touch projects here. They all meet in this big central area called the posterior parietal. This is the next layer. Now, after that, where does it go? After that, it, it doesn't go to simply some nearby region. It digs through the deep, the volume, the body of the brain and ends up somewhere here. The posterior parietal. So the logical next stage or the central most stage, right, which is, which is this one, right, is here in the posterior parietal. And here again, you can think of multiple sub layers. Okay, that's a different matter. But point is, central layer is not in the center of the brain. The central layer in the network is in one end of the brain. So this is what is very confusing when you try to understand brain. 
So therefore, it will be a lot more intuitive if you uh, take guidance from this kind of a simple network picture and then try to interpret the meaning of different brain regions by this comparison. So your centralmost region is here. After the centralmost region, you have to go to different uh, layers, subsequent layers, which then activate different uh, motor uh, organs, right? And that happens here. So from here, this uh, prefrontal cortex, which is the centralmost area, you can activate your primary motor cortex, which will produce movements of your hand and legs and so on. Or you can activate your Broca's area, which will have produce your movement of you know, your speech output and so on and so forth. So this is the, so the picture below shows the logical order. The picture above shows how jumbled the brain areas are, although they are actually implementing the kind of order that I'm showing in the lower part of the image. So brain's anatomy doesn't follow this order, it follows some other order, because the placement is different, the connectivity pattern is just like what I'm showing here in the figure below, but the placement of different regions is pretty complicated. Okay, so the prefrontal cortex is here, this, this front of the front. And here you have, uh, so this is a very important area, this is where the decision making and all this takes place. And your sense of self, the sense of your, as a sense of a, being a person, right, with your own ideas and plans and, you know, future dreams, and all that comes from your, uh, you, you know, your prefrontal cortex. And a lot of our earliest understanding of this part of the brain came from this accident, which I mentioned in the last one of the previous classes. This guy called Phineas Gage uh, was in an accident, a, rail, a railroad accident, where a crowbar went through his brain. And in fact, in this picture, this is a reconstruction based on his, I don't know, there's no X-ray at that time. But I don't know, based on his uh, uh, the dead body, they must have done a reconstruction. So it went through his uh, prefrontal cortex. The person survived that accident, the person survived the surgery, but there were serious personality changes that were observed in that person's behavior after the surgery. So this, his doctor was, uh, this was the commentary that of his doctor about the patient's condition after the surgery. He said, Gage was fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity. He would use foul language, right? Which was not previously his custom. He was not like that before, before surgery. Manifesting but little deference for his fellows. He was not respectful. Earlier he was respectful. He would talk nicely to other people but now he's very rude, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires. So if he sets his mind to something, he wants something, he cannot wait. And if you ask him to wait or if you ask him not to do something, he'll get very upset. At times, pertinaciously obstinate, so he's very stubborn in, you know, in pursuing whatever he wants, yet capricious and vacillating. So he's not only obstinate, but sometimes it's also quite capricious, fanciful. That is, he makes a plan and immediately he changes his mind very quickly and he vacillates. Should I do it or should I not do it? Right? Devising many plans of future operations, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. So basically what he's saying is, uh, this person can be very stubborn. I can you know, obstinate. It might say that I want this and that's all nobody can comes me against it, or he can show the opposite behavior where one moment he wants it, next moment he doesn't want it. And keeps changing his plans. So this is what happens when the prefrontal is damaged. So that gives an idea of what the normal function of prefrontal must be, right? So prefrontal normally is, gives you, first of all, a sense of, a stable sense of self, right? And also it gives you, uh, you know, makes you plan, right, for future activities because, <clears throat> The way we produce movements is not simply by directly responding to sensory stimuli, right? Suppose you're studying for an exam. You're not responding to stimuli, you have a big plan. You might think that, okay, I have exam coming up on Friday, so I'll set up a time Thursday evening for I'll study for this and Thursday, uh, I don't know, you know, Thursday night I'll study for this, Thursday evening I'll do something else. And you have a big plan, you're not constantly responding to stimuli, right? All that planning happens in your prefrontal. Okay, and if the prefrontal is damaged and you cannot plan, you cannot stick to a plan. So you are very vacillating. Or even if you 
strict tier plan, it could be completely an absurd plan, no connection with your ultimate goals. So, so you see the importance of uh, prefrontal cortex, although the person survived the accident, I mean, it's a quite a miserable life because the most important functions of a human being, ability to have goals, ability to have plans, and stick with those plans for extended periods. All these uh, you know, capacities are destroyed because of damage to this very important part of the brain. So prefront is involved in goal-oriented goal -oriented behavior, which involves planning and requires working memory. So there's a part of the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is not just one singular area. It has lots of small regions. And all of them work together in, in, in making these plans and all that. So one of those areas is what is called dorsolateral prefrontal. Uh, so this region has a role in working memory and decision making. And uh, so therefore damage to this part will give cognitive deficits. Uh, it will, you will have problem with you know, speaking, with verbal fluency. And uh, most importantly, it has problems in what is called delayed response task. Because when you make you know, comments like this, it has, a, you know, it has a role in, it shows cognitive deficits. It was very vague, right? Because in experiment neuroscience, you cannot just say, you know, it is involved in cognitive function. Or, you know, it has cognitive deficits when it is damaged. You need to be very precise, right? You, know, you should say that in a given experiment, this damage to this when this damage is this this part of the brain that patient will perform very badly in this particular study okay so that's a very precise you know uh, way of defining what that uh, brain area does so for example patients with uh, damage to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex which is located here right uh, they have trouble performing this task this task is called delayed response task so in this task uh, there are you know, two two boxes Okay, and uh, empty boxes, and at some point, while well, the animal is seeing, you, know, you do this this kind of experiment with monkeys. You can also do it with humans, right? Uh, but uh, a lot of the studies are done with monkeys because very often you may have to expose the brain and record from single neurons, and that kind of thing you cannot do all the time with people. You do in special conditions, but otherwise, normally you do with monkeys or do with animals. So you have. Let's say you put a banana under one of the boxes, the other box is empty, right? You, you place it as the, when the monkey is looking at it, and then you put a screen and wait for some time. Okay, so the animal is expected to remember that the banana is in, in front of A and not in, uh, is under A and not under B. And then after that, it, the, the screen is lifted and the animal is allowed to pick up the banana. That is, open the correct box and pick up the banana. So an animal with a normal DLPFC, which is intact, right, will remember that banana was under A and pick it up. But if it is the DLPFC is damaged, it won't be able to hold on to that information for sufficiently long time, right? So that information gets erased very quickly, right? And therefore, it may pick up a, a wrong uh, wrong box. Then there is something called medial prefrontal cortex. So the lateral and medial, we need to understand these terms. Lateral means to the side of the brain. Actually, this picture is not quite correct because lateral is outside. Okay, so this is this is the, so if you cut the brain from the middle, what's called the mid sagittal section, the inner side of the brain is normally not exposed. You, if you cut the brain to half, you expose it. This is, this is, this is called the medial side of the brain. Uh, so the so those this is the medial side the medial parts of the frontal cortex okay so that is called the medial prefrontal cortex right and this is again also involved in decision making but uh, also uh, involved in the table of remote long term memories consolidation of memory short term memory uh, and so on a lot of memory related operations so damage to this area causes impaired stress response and deficits in retrieving you know long the memories from long ago Okay, so that gives an idea of uh, kind of a big map of brain's cortical areas. We only have discussed cortical areas in this uh, class. So to summarize, cortex is a sheet of neurons covering the entire brain surface, the cerebrum surface, cerebral surface, and it has six layers of neurons, right? And uh, we have seen that sensory information flows 
upwards via distinct pathways, right? And uh, more information flows downwards, just a manner of speaking, and downwards via distinct pa hierarchical pathways. And between these two, so the sensory motor, sensory information and motor, and uh, where sensory, motor, sensory information ends and motor information begins, right? somewhere at that junction point, at the central most layers, right? that's where you have the prefrontal cortex, right, uh, which is involved in decision making. Decision making means deciding which action is appropriate. Okay, so so that all that uh, occurs in the central most area, which is the prefrontal cortex. One important point I want to again emphasize is that uh, there is a logical order in which you know you can you you would like to understand different brain areas, but the placement of the of the brain areas in the brain is not in that logical order. So you need to kind of get used to that. But otherwise it's very simple. If you look at the correct connectivity pattern uh, for which you have to understand the hidden connections, right? It's, uh, it's very simple. Okay, so with that, we can end with the discussion of uh, cortex. So in the next class, we'll discuss uh, some of the key subcortical structures and what they do. And after that, we'll start discussion of uh, other brain aspects like you know memory and brain maps and things like that.